Hi, I'm Bill Duffin, and welcome to this edition of the Forensic Update. Now, let's face it, rats aren't the first animal to pop into your mind when mentioning the word hero. But the Gambian pouched rat, measuring nearly three feet from nose to tail, earns that label by sniffing out landmines in countries like Afghanistan and Cambodia. When humans sweep for explosives, it's a long, tedious, and dangerous process using a metal detector that can't discriminate between an IED or a nail. The Gambian pouch rat, on the other hand, has a keen sense of smell that allows it to tell the difference. Since they weigh roughly three pounds, the rats are too light to set off the explosives, keeping them safe as they navigate the fields. A popo, a company that started the Hero Rat program, allows you to remotely adopt a rat, which pays for the training and welfare throughout their lifespan. Innocent victims of violent crimes don't always walk on two legs. Unfortunately, many animals themselves far too often become the center of criminal investigations. In animal cruelty cases, forensic veterinarians, like Dr. Melinda Merck, step in with a unique skill set. As an active investigator and trainer, Dr. Merck has not only provided her expertise to numerous cases, but also the textbook Veterinary Forensics, Animal Cruelty Investigations. NFSTC's communications specialist, Michelle Chernikoff, sat down with her to learn more. Thank you, Dr. Merck, for joining us today. Let's get right into it. Can you tell us how you got involved and why you got interested in veterinary forensics? I got involved in Atlanta, actually, back in 2002, 2001. What happened was the Georgia state had passed new animal cruelty laws and in, in the year 2000. The problem was no one was investigating or prosecuting. So there was a group formed called Georgia Legal Professionals for Animals, and I joined that group. And the mandate was to provide free education to the key players, which was law enforcement, prosecutors, and veterinarians. So I started working with medical examiners and forensic scientists, forensic entomologists, pathologists, and learning, trying to learn their fields and see how it could, if at all, apply to animals. It's fascinating just how similar these can be, but... Now tell us how these two disciplines are different. The biggest distinct difference is, is that animals respond to trauma differently. They're not made to bleed from their skin the same way as we do. Uh, they're made to survive outside. Um, so that definitely will impact um, crime scene reconstruction, blood stain pattern analysis, because it's not the same. Also, uh, that the same issue with bleeding applies to surface bruising. Visible bruising is rarely seen in animals. And when it is seen, it, it, it indicates significant trauma. Animals just don't bruise easily. Most of their trauma, if they're gonna have damaged blood vessels, which is the cause of bruising, it's underneath the skin and not necessarily visible. The behavior of animals makes it difficult for human experts to um, analyze crime scenes, for example, or it can cause some reluctance to get to fully involve themselves in cases because we know what humans do because we're the same species. So we can predict behavior, know where to look for evidence, but animals' behavior is different. And so where they look for evidence or how they analyze or interpret the findings at a scene um, is directly impacted by the species of that animal um, and their age and so forth. In human cases, Traditionally, we're looking for DNA on a water bottle or a cigarette butt. In animal cases, where are you collecting DNA? One of the things that law enforcement should remember is that no one can come into a scene where there's been an animal or is an animal without walking out with some kind of evidence on them. It may be fur. Um, it may be feces. Um, so the key things to look for are their, the bottoms of their clothes, their, their pants and their shoes and their socks, because we can get DNA from animal feces, um, urine, if and, uh, they walk through that, if they walk through a yard, chances are they picked up some kind of animal evidence. Dr. Merck, thank you so much for joining us today and talking to us about this fascinating subject. Okay, thank you. You can see more of this fascinating interview with Dr. Merck in its entirety on our YouTube channel right now. Bacteria may be small, but when it comes to forensic science, they're making big headlines. Scientists are finding our body's bacteria, called microbes or microbiomes, may be the new tool in the industry. Researchers from Harvard say a person's gut bacteria and microbes are unique and may be helpful in identification. 
the study worked with the Humane Microbiome Project to develop a database similar to CODIS in order to track bacteria. The Microbiome Journal published another study revealing how your steps can be traced using the bacteria on your shoes. The team also found that the microbiomes on a person's phone can create a unique pattern that may become useful for identification. We'll get you more information on this story as it develops. Our Biometric and Forensic ROTC internship is just around the corner, but there's still time to donate to support this year's class. NFSTC has hosted this intensive two-week program for the past six years at no charge to the cadets or their command. You can find a link to donate to this unique opportunity, plus more information about all of our featured stories on our As Seen on the Forensic Update page located on our website. Well, that's it for this edition of the Forensic Update. For Michelle Chernikoff and all of us here at NFSTC, I'm Bill Duffin, and thanks for watching.